Welcome to the Patriotic Podcast. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another edition of the Patriotic Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Danny O'Neill. I'm Ryan G, and today we have a very special guest. I am uh, Justin Spielman. So Justin and I uh, served in the Army together. We've known each other now for about 17 years by my calculations, which is long enough for you to grow a long gray beard, I guess. I guess, and I guess that's where the gray beard comes from, is knowing you for 17 years. <laughs> Well, that seems fair. Thank you. You don't want to see what happens if I grow my beard. Listen, you guys are the ones who cause me all the fucking stress. Well, you made me laugh. Well, yeah, that's probably true, but, you know, it is what it is. So, Justin was a scout in the United States Army? I was. So, I was a scout. Uh, so, scouts uh, went out and did reconnaissance work. They went and looked for the bad guys. Um, we were attached to Echo Company. Um, that's where Captain Hamill and Captain Frazier uh, tragically passed away. But to that, I say, uh, God rest them. And, you know, it is to them. To them. To the boys. So, as we drink our girly drinks, let me tell you. <laughs> hey, I'm trying to watch my figure. Likewise, I'll watch it. Thank you. It's uh, seven. Uh, actually, I'm sorry, seven ninety nine on OnlyFans. Just hit me up there. We can run a little promo. Up yeah. <laughs> if you want to pick, I mean, plug it. Well, he plugged himself. Okay. Uh, so Captain Hamill and Captain Frazier were the uh, commanding officer, the CEO, and the executive officer XO, uh, of Echo Company, and they died the day we were leaving, November 26, 2006. Uh, the day we were leaving Iraq, they were they were killed in the EFP explosion. Uh, when they were attacked in their uh, Buffalo. So instead of their family getting home their hero after a year in hell, they got a knock at the door saying, I'm sorry. And I think everyone felt, even the whole battalion felt that, you know, just take any hope that we had, like going home, we were excited, but that kind of ended any excitement. Well, I feel it was kind of like the curse of Rustamaya, being that when we arrived there, uh, the third ID soldier who passed away on Christmas, and then um, Christmas morning they drove a V-bid right into our front gate, killed a kid who was supposed to be leaving as well, and um, almost burned one of our guys. Uh, so that guy, I don't know if you know all that, but the guy who was killed, his his gunner, uh, or excuse me, his TC tried to pull him out. as the driver. He was in the hatch, and they were trying to pull him out, and like his meat came off. And he couldn't get him out. And that guy has not done good since then because they hit the fuel cell. Right. And the vehicle caught on fire. Yeah. But, and that was our introduction to Rust of Maya. Welcome. This is your home for a year. Yeah, this is your home. Welcome. Um, yeah. Okay. Good luck. Yeah, good luck. Uh, That's about accurate, man. But uh, we did, I, I feel we did start to make progress. We, we did clean up the sides of the roads. We made uh, effort to make Iraq better, but I don't see what the end was for Iraq in a sense, like, yeah, I don't. And y your platoon spent more time out in sector than any other platoon in our battalion. We and I did, think that's saying something. We did. There, uh, at some point, some high-ranking official came to me and asked me, uh, when was the last time I had a, a day off? And I was like, wait, we're getting days off around here? Like, okay. what, <laughs> like what's going on? That makes me laugh. I'll tell you why. I asked I asked the first sergeant, because, you know, I, I was Bravo's... Uh, fist nco and then when we got to iraq they moved me over to uh alpha and they had a real shitty area cool so i asked the first sergeant over there hey uh first sergeant Tur uh, turner i think right hey can i can i send my guys to qatar cutter the guys in the talk are going and they get a little bit of rest but a few days off you know and like it, it is pretty fucking bad so and I think I asked for that, like, right after Jenkins was killed. So what I was told by the first sergeant was, uh, you got someone to take their place? And I was like, negative first sergeant. You know, like, I, at first I was like, you know, you got guys for leave. He's like, I have enough guys to cover the people who go on leave. I don't have guys to be going, hanging out in Qatar or whatever else, Qatar. That's not going to happen. 
you could have the guys in the talk take their spot. And I was like, really? That's what we're doing now? We're, you want me to let one of those guys in there? Uh, Harley? Remember Harley? Harley was like a little ginger dude that used his um, cold weather, like little nylon joints as a ninja suit. Like he, he I don't even know how he ended up in the army. You know what I'm talking yes. about? When I first yes. saw him, Whitfield asked him if he was doing PT. He said he was doing Dance Dance Revolution. I swear to God, like this was. <laughs> There's some wild people in the army, dude. Wow. Well, as you stated earlier, and I thought we should, it's a <clears throat> poignant, uh, valid point. Just because someone served in the military doesn't mean they're a good person. There's a lot of pieces of shit I met in the fucking army. Yeah, that is, that is correct. We, dude, I, after this whole experience or this whole like little weekend getaway, I think we should have recorded this entire thing because we've had some great intellectual content or, uh, like conversations amongst the three of us. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, dude, wild, wild people in the military will scam you, will mm -hmm. scam their own people. And it's like, why would you want to do that to the, your brethren? Like, yeah, I don't, I wouldn't want to do that. Right. And why would you want to do it to someone else? But I don't know. People got to get out there and survive and get out the way to, to do it. Yeah. We came all the way from Virginia to come be on the, on the podcast and come hang out with us, man. So I appreciate you. And it's great to see you and just hang out with you. Also, for those of you at home, Spielman just got the very first Warfighter Overwatch tattoo on his leg like 20 minutes ago. I'm a little jealous right now. Uh, that is correct. Um, I am the first. So uh, I am the first walking billboard for uh, yeah. Warfighter Overwatch. I feel like I owe you like some month, like 50 bucks a month for like advertising <laughs> yeah. or some shit. Yeah, but you know, you never know. You never know. This is what Ryan would, I think Ryan would advocate for. Hey, I have a dream, and I think the three of us can work it all out, so we, we might right. be able to do something. You got the camera equipment. Well, no, not like that. Oh, I heard about scouts. Anyhow. Hey, uh, hey, hey, hey. I, well, all right. So <laughs> I will tell, I know we were going to tell some stories we had talked about, and I'm going to let you, I know you have some you want to bring up. And I said that I would tell, like, one of the craziest nights, I was on CQ. I was the NCO on duty. And um, I was in charge of the barracks. So they would send me on, like, uh, the weekends. I don't know why. I think, like, my platoon sergeant or first sergeant, whoever thought, like, I would be an enforcer to make sure the guys are doing what they're supposed to. If you make me work on my days off, you're not going to get much out of me. Mm -mm. So I would show up, and in my car would be my TV, my video game system, some video games. Probably just really one that I was going to Probably just going to play Madden or Call of Duty. Like, those are going to be the two that I played. So... Uh, or Halo, that was it. Anyhow, when I was on duty, it was like Saturday, so I'm doing some checks, walking around the barracks, and up on the third floor, I got the scout platoon up there, and they're looking across the barracks over where there was like a, what we would call a pogue unit over there. So uh, they, were, they had females. This was before females integrated into combat uh, MOSs. So these girls were sunbathing topless, on top of the building there. This Texas, Fort Hood. It was, it was a pretty good time. So these guys are up there with their binos checking out the girls. And I thought, nah, let me show you guys how to observe. As a forward observer, I felt that my responsibility and as an NCO is an opportunity to teach. <laughs> so I grabbed the binos, I checked. And then I said, all right, 10 more minutes. I don't need you guys getting in trouble. And I don't think they listened. But I didn't care. I left. They were busy. Most of, a lot of them were busy, uh, like, shooting these little... They're like they're like the uh, first versions of Airsoft at the time. They're yeah. just little little plastic BBs. So that that was me. I was the good soldier doing training that day. I was not <laughs> looking at boobies, but hashtag free the nipple. Yeah, they were those little fucking BBs, Mister Good Soldier, were everywhere, all over the fucking barracks. Like you could you'd go like sliding on the fucking things if you were, like didn't pay attention. So they're like, oh, knock on the door, getting then kick the door in, and you know it's just a small little barracks room. But anyhow, it was a good time. So. That day continued. As we got to the nighttime, things started getting ramped up. People are drunk. They're starting to come in drunk. I don't care about any of this. Oh, you're 19? I don't give a fuck. I really don't care. As long as you're, like, you're here, you're safe. Fine. So that night, I, everybody came in, was playing video games, hanging out. And then I, uh, like, early, I played video games. And then, like, early in the morning, I put that stuff away, like, 4 o'clock, 4.30, something like that. And I went and did another barracks check. Now, one of the rooms was like Doc Bryant's, and he had his keys still in his door. He'd opened his door, but walked in and went and passed out, completely passed out. 
blackout drunk. That's how we used to do it. We drink, drink for real. So anyhow, uh, he said, hey, I, I, oh, yeah, I woke him up, said, hey, here's your keys. Make sure your door's locked. Because Sergeant Major would randomly sometimes come on the weekend and just open doors and start doing a room inspection. So Doc was like, I owe you a, a breakfast burrito or whatever. I owe you a burrito. I was like, cool. So I kept going. And one of the rooms I came to, I opened the door. It's unlocked. Most of them are locked. This one's unlocked. I open it. And there's literally bottles everywhere. I mean, all over the fucking. There's no way I could really walk around in here without knocking some over. So I try to creep in there. I got uh, a guy and a girl, so there's no females allowed in our barracks. So I got a female in the barracks, and they got some wall lockers, and then there's another uh, bed, and I kind of go over there, and I, like, knock a bottle over, and I'm trying to be quiet. I got two guys in there spooning. This has not happened to me before. So I go back out. Two I'm guys s- in there spooning? Two guys on the same bed spooning. And um, so I wasn't really sure what to do. I step outside. I go back outside of the room, and I'm thinking for a minute. And I see staff duty, Sergeant Perkins. Rest in peace, Sergeant Perkins. He committed suicide uh, a few years back. So, Sergeant Perkins, I was like, yo, Sergeant Perk, I need your help. He's like, what's up? He's walking through the parking lot. I just happened to be walking through right then, you know, whatever time, 530, whatever it was. And he was like, what's up? And I said, man, I got two guys in here laying in bed, and I've never, you know, I don't, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do. And he was like, nah. Fucking miss me with that shit. You didn't call me for the titties yesterday. <laughs> Deal with this shit on your own. And I shit you not. He just kept walking, smoking a cigarette, bro. Did not give no fucks. Okay. So then I turn around and now I'm frustrated because he just ignored. He didn't help me. Right. He didn't help me. So now I'm mad. I'm like, motherfucker, you're the person I'm supposed to call if I have any issues while I'm on um, CQ. So I go in there and now I kick this shit over. I fucking open the door and I kick all the bottles. Over. Clang, 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 clang. So they get up. Everybody like kind of gets up at ease. They call it ease. And Smith, who's one of the guys spooning, pulls down his shorts and standing there with his dick swinging. Well, you know. And I was like, uh, Smitty, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> Smitty said, I'm late for PT, sir. He thought he was late. He was going to get up and get dressed and go run some fucking five miles because he's a goddamn infantryman. That's his job. But it's Sunday, Smitty, so just go ahead and put your pants back up, bud. That'd be real sweet. For the longest time, I thought that the person in that bed was Dan Evans. Sorry, Dan. I did for like a decade, probably. I thought that was Dan Evans. But one of our other buddies, Corey, recently, and I won't say his last name right now, but (laughs) Corey thanked me for not, I could have ruined kind of their career. Yeah, I was going to ask what year this was. Yeah, so this was in 2005 before we deployed, and but I asked, are any of you 21? Because I knew f- pretty much for sure two of them were not 21. And the girl chimes in, I'll be 21 in a week. And I said, you're not supposed to be here. Just shut the fuck up. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that was kind of like, it made me laugh. Like, you guys are idiots. This is definitely some shit I would have done. I'm not really going to ruin your career over this. So I didn't. I like helped them kind of. Get through it. All right. So no one got in trouble. He thanked me because he said Bertolini, our colonel, Bertolini would have kicked me out. And I have no doubts about that. If you fucked up, he would kick you out. Yeah, because Bertolini didn't play. At all. Bernie Bellini was kicking people out before we left because they couldn't, like, pass PT tests. Like, you had to be on your game. If you can't trust a person mm-hmm. you're left and right, they don't belong going to war with you. So, like, any DUI, <laughs> he kicked you out. Like, any infraction like that, yep. you were gone. Yeah. Follow-up question. How does pulling your dick out make you any more ready for PT? He was going to put on his PT clothes and go. He was going to change. Oh, so you caught him He you caught him at parade rest like while he was changing or something? Like, I go in there. One of the guys yells parade rest. He jumps up and thinks, oh, shit, the sergeant's in my room because I'm drunk and didn't get up for PT. <laughs> I also feel with Smith, he drank until he fell asleep or just yeah. drank and did not know when to stop. But that's a hundred percent true. Um, and just so everyone's aware, everyone in there, like triplet was the other guy. He was a fucking mess. Uh, he told the, I'll give you an example. He worked in the three shop. He told the three Sergeant major, Sergeant major may, Hey, uh, I took some drugs this weekend. I think he said, I smoked some pot. Uh, so we had a drug test and he thought like, all right, they're going to, I'm going to get out of it. But what happened was they made him take the drug test and said, you're not going to get in trouble. We're going to send you to rehab. Except he tested positive, I think, for 
ecstasy, coke, something. It was not weed. And they, but they'd already like told him, you'll be okay. We're just going to send you to get help. So Evans, the following year when we were in Iraq, had an EFP hit his vehicle, bounce off of his back, shred his plate, throw the hatch from the Humvee 200 yards down the road, burned his back. He's okay, but he, the, this is TBI right here. He thought he was smoking a cigarette. He was apologizing to Sarn Ellsbury, saying, I'm sorry, Sarn. He's like, what the fuck are you talking about? Get another MV. Get the fuck out of here. He thought he dropped his cigarette. He's like, I was smoking my cigarette, and I dropped it in the gas tank and blew us up. Yeah, so when <laughs> Evans was, uh, like, kind of coming in and out of consciousness, so when he, it hit him, it ripped his all of his body armor off. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, so he was running up and down the street and asking for his weapon, he had no clue what was going on, like who he was, but he wanted his weapon. Yeah. And I was like, dude, that's what's up, man. Like, that's a you're safe getting space, back, bro. Yeah, you're getting your back in the instinct. fight. Yeah. Yeah. No one's coming to rescue you. It's on you. And you figure that out real quick over right. there. Like, yep. no one's like, okay, QRF, well, they're 30 minutes away or they're 45 minutes. However, who fucking knows how long. I remember Santamont jumping out the truck, running and going, check for secondary devices, check for secondary. I was like, dude, that's what's up. He's yeah. a leader right there. I was like, yeah. So shout out to Santa Monica because that's Santa Monica's truck's the one that got hit. Um, mm-hmm. And then it was the truck immediately behind me. That was a wild day, a wild day. Um, well, imagine that for the folks at home listening to this who don't understand what that's like. You drive by a bomb that hits the very next vehicle or you drive, you know. Yeah, so if just imagine you're following your friend behind you in a vehicle, and uh, you're the very front one, and then your friend's in the rear, and the rear vehicle gets hit with an explosive that just rocks its fucking world. And that's uh, not normal, because they usually try to hit the front vehicle. They do try to hit the front. So um, I had what was called that rhino mount. It, it was that uh, a jerry-rigged fucking ammo can with a glow plug rigged to the battery yeah. and a switch. To stop, uh, yep, to set it off prematurely. Frequency, yeah. Yep. So the theory behind that was that it gave off a ten to twenty foot standoff distance to where if and when the EFP did go off, it blew up the uh, the the engine block of the Humvee to just give you that little bit of safe space. So yeah. That's what yeah was, the, so what's well, hold on. What's funny with that Rhino mount is uh, I played a personal game of how close I could get it to Iraqis at nighttime <laughs> with night vision, so I would sneak up with there. The Humvee. What was the nickname of the Rhino? It was a dick. What kind of dick? A dedicated individual combat killer. All right. Just in case anybody needed abbreviations around here. Uh, so for the folks at home who don't know what an EFP is, this is an IED, but it's a special one that Iran helped these dickheads make, and they were explosively formed penetrators. So what they would do is it's this copper charge, and once they set it off, uh, it would go into the vehicle and blow up, kill everyone in there. They were nasty. Yep. Kill your tank. Bradley, Humvee, didn't really matter. I had a lot of guilt with that uh, that episode or that day, but uh, through yoga, I've come to uh, like get a different perspective on it where, uh, you know, if we didn't get hit, the next vehicle that would have got hit would have been the casual t- or the Casivac vehicle for the people that got hit in front of us. And they yeah. got hit way worse than us. So it's like, I can look at it and be like, okay, we took, we took a hit, but... It wasn't as bad as the people in front of us. And if we didn't take that EFP, the casualties from the, the ones before it would have been done. So let me ask you this. How do you go from being combat bad motherfucker, scout, frontline warfighter to cannabis grower, yoga participant, uh, I've always loved cannabis since uh, high school, yeah. and uh, there's a lot of beautiful women at yoga, and uh, theoretically, it is $2 cheaper, and if I didn't, well, it is not $2 cheaper than going to the strip club, because fucking taxes, um, <laughs> but, you know, there's beautiful women in yoga, and I feel like when I, I, <laughs> I feel like when I'm in yoga, I've definitely left my body, like, and I've been scared that I'm not going to be able to come back into my body. Like, I thought that was the end of it. There's a thing in yoga called the Savasana. It's where you uh, have to submit to death, but they don't like calling it that because why would you want to sell submitting yourself to death? But anywho, um, the Savasana is where it's at, dude. I'm telling you. Um, 
So that's where I gained a lot of perspective from uh, a lot of things. But yeah, uh, it it definitely led with, uh, you know, giving it a chance. Some old dude from the VA was like, hey, you should probably do that. And I was like, all right, I'll try him one day. Yeah. And I tried it. So uh, old dudes know a lot of stuff, man. Old dudes do know a lot of stuff, and yep. they old dudes will help you along the way with like figuring shit out. And as I feel like I'm getting older, maybe that's what I need to be doing with life is, is like, hey, this yeah. is what's up in life. I think we are, man. Like, uh, I think that I've realized, especially since we've been like, we helped this kid, Tyler Andrews, the Marine who was blown up in Afghanistan. You know, he's like, he's 24 now, and like. You know, he's, he's a kid. I'm his mom's age, right? Or, you know, pretty close. So that's, that was my realization. Like, you're the OG now. Like, you've been through this shit. You've been down this road. When his mom was on her way to uh, to uh, Germany, I knew, like, she was going to, if he was going to live, they were going to go to Walter Reed and she was going to be there for a while. So when she landed, uh, she had an apartment and a car ready to go. She didn't have to worry about any of that shit. And she just gave it back a couple months ago, you know, when she, she finally came home. So I think going through all the crap we did helped me prepare to help these dudes more. And I think that has given me purpose when I definitely felt like I didn't have any. And I know a lot of guys struggle with purpose. You know, we've had 15 suicides from our unit. And that's pretty damn hard to say considering, like, First off, some of these guys were from your platoon. Some of these guys were, yeah. you know, people that we spent a lot of time with. And um, well, I mean, if, if your company commander commits suicide, it's kind of like a well, wait a minute, what the fuck? Yeah. Like, wait, this is an officer, and I believe you were an officer as well. So uh, later on, I would like to get your opinion on that. But uh, I, I, yeah, it's like, oh my god, man, what what's going on? And yeah. then. I remember saying or calling the VA at one point and the VA would hang up on you. Like you would get to the end of their spiel and the phone would be like, er, or whatever, the, the, yeah. the end of the dial tone. And I'm like, what, what? This is, this is, this is the government. Like, this is what I have to deal with. The quality of care that you get. I know. But see, and the reason we have such a big problem with that is we're always accountable, right? Like to the team, we're always we have to do our job. If you don't do your job, you don't watch your sector, the guy, what you're taught from the very beginning, that guy's going to get killed and it's your fault, right? So they put this like huge weight on your shoulders already. Do your fucking job, right? Ownership. And when we leave the service, it's hard to find civilians who do that because they don't get, they're working for a company. For there's no, yeah, there's no accountability. That's right. They're not working for the people that left and right to survive. They're working for a paycheck. So I think the mentality is different and that a lot of guys struggle with that. And that, I get that. I do because that was frustrating. And the way we talk to people in the military, right? When someone's screwing up, most of the stuff in the regular army that you're taught is you're going to go belittle and degrade that guy, right? Hey, dickhead. Uh, why don't, or hey, fuck stick. Why don't you fix yourself? Cause you are ate up, right? And you tell them how to, how to do better. I used right. to be convinced that NCOs were issued like a book of funny insults. Yeah. Like they're so degrading, but they're like meant to make you laugh so they can fuck you up even more. Right. Cause the moment you laugh, we're going to get more yeah. angry. Yeah. I, I wish that was the case that you had this little book, but I think it's just passed down generational to generational on things. Like you just it pick is. it and you're like, this is a wild thing that this dude just said. I'm going to use it again. Yes, the funniest, I, the funniest thing, Sergeant First Class Ramirez, this, this uh, I was still in RTC and we were running a lot, like more than I'd ever run. I, I came in in pretty good shape. I was probably like 180 pounds. Yeah. But then we were running like five, six miles at a time, which I had never done. I played football. Like I played football and baseball. The first, the furthest I've ever run is 90 feet. You know what I mean? <laughs> so like running these, running these, <laughs> These long distance runs were brutal and I was just dropping weight and I got down to like 145 Damn. and uh, I showed up in a suit to one of our mill balls because I didn't have a uniform yet. Like uh -huh. I, I wasn't in, you know, yeah. and um, he looked at me and he was like, man, if you get any skinny, you're going to fall through your asshole and hang yourself. <laughs> <laughs> See? And I was like, I knew it couldn't smoke me there so I could laugh a little bit, but I'm like, writing that down, dude. I'll never forget that. That was one yeah. of the greatest insults of all time. See, and I also remember some of the motivational stuff that they taught me. Like, the best one ever was from Sergeant Odom. And he said, men, 
You got to be like a penis, firm but flexible. <laughs> it made perfect sense because the army was always changing what we were doing. It seemed pretty stupid. And he's like, listen, we don't always have to, you know, sometimes we have to adjust. And the army's going to make us continue to do that. So you got to be firm but flexible, okay? Why does that make so much sense? And I was like, I'm going to remember that. It's probably some other stuff he said, too. Well, yeah, know. like, he's probably thinking, like, what's one thing the frontline soldier's never, ever going to forget about? Like, his, his dick. dick. His dick. <laughs> yeah. Like, so there's a picture of us, and we're all standing there uh, on the Bradley getting ready to go out on a mission. We're going to put on our, like, we got our... Uh, IBA on, but we had a zip up vest that went over that. So we're about to put on all our ammo, all our shit. And we're standing outside the, on the ramp. And I, as years later, after we took that picture, but Sergeant King was in there and he's like, Hey man, why am I the only one wearing a dick protector? Right? Said, like your <laughs> nut protector. She's got this like big pad. Yeah. Part of it's supposed to hang. None of us had it on. Yeah. Not one of us except him. Mm -hmm. I was like, I don't, I don't, I don't really know. I, <laughs> Probably a good idea to put that on just in case, but he's he like a little league catcher. Yes, <laughs> yeah. He just loved his wiener a little well, bit more than you. I, th I was—I didn't want to say anything because I don't want to sound racist. But Son King's black; and he probably had a bigger dick than all the rest of us. So he's, you know, got more. He needs more protection. One of the other officers I met—I um, won't say his name because he's still in. And, um, <laughs> but um, <laughs> he told us a story. You were talking about EFPs earlier, and um, he said that like one of his one of the first losses or heaviest losses, I can't remember if it was first heaviest or both, but um, he lost this kid. He's like a specialist mm -hmm. and he's just a wild motherfucker. He was an infantryman. Um, and they, he said that like this guy was responsible for a lot of the platoons high morale. Like he was yeah. like the Joker, you know what I mean? But yeah. like what he would get to going when shit got serious yeah. and uh, he was taken out by an EFP. But I, I guess like afterward when, um, he was sending stuff home to his family. He found like a, I couldn't remember if it was like a whiteboard or a notebook or something, but it was like his three goals for the deployment. And the first two were like pretty standard, like get the most kills, get yeah. the, you know what I mean? But then number three was get a bigger dick. Like he, this guy wanted to do so good on this deployment that his dick grew. And, and, and he fucking loved that. I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to send you my buddy's book. I can he's, totally a, see. he's a scout. <laughs> bigger dick. My, my buddy's a scout, and I'm going to send you the book. And it ties into this, which is why I bring it up. His name's Jose. I love you, Navarro. So, Jose got blown up pretty good in Afghanistan. Uh, I don't want to lie. Was he in third ID? He, he got fucked up. He, oh, he's in 82nd, maybe. In 82nd. Anyways, he got fucked up. He got burned. His leg was all fucked up. His dick was affected by the, it was burned and shit, it was pretty bad. So they're going to give him like a prosthetic. And they tried. And it like, it failed. So like turned black and died. Gross, right? Yeah. You should read this wait, book. Wait, a prosthetic? Like pee, pee Or like a transplant? Like a, no. Okay. Yeah. They made, yeah, they made one or whatever. So now, he, he had like a couple issues and this was, fucking with his head pretty bad you know if you could just imagine like your manhood is you know at stake here well now gone twice right yeah and i think maybe even the third time if i'm not mistaken i'm almost positive for, for a while he had nothing he's like there was like just scar is like messed up mangled so nah so then he ends up in i want to say beverly hills with like one of the best plastic surgeons and he could probably tell me i'm sure it's in the i can't remember like you know does all the rich folks down in Beverly Hills or whatever, but guy, he goes down and talks to this guy. He's like, so what do you want? <laughs> what do you think he wanted? He wanted bigger. <laughs> so he's very pleased with how he's like, doctor even gave me a couple extra inches, gave me, gave me some girth, gave me, he's very proud of his uh, PP. Now. He's also, he's now married, by the way. He's the, my man's doing it. He's living life. That's what's up. Yeah. That's yeah, what's just, up. I was, that was making me think of the whole time of the South Park episode where they grow the dick on the back of a rat. <laughs> <laughs> South Park's awesome. It's only a matter of time before they're doing that shit. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love Rick and Morty. Y'all fans of those too? <laughs> yes. Yes. All right. Cool. I was just about to bring that up. <laughs> did you see, did you see you Sonny's tattoo? You already know what episode you're talking about, dude. Sonny, Sonny has a Rick and Morty tattoo. In fact, he just yeah. added some to it. Uh, 
And like for his birthday last year, I got him Rick and Morty shoes. He's a huge Rick and Morty fan. I saw the uh, the pickle Rick cup, so yeah. I was like, all right, yep. yeah, I love Rick and Morty. Yeah, it, I love it too, dude. It's wild. I was thinking of that when he was talking about prosthetic dicks because <laughs> <laughs> there's an episode where, uh, the, like one of the main characters' wives doesn't want her her husband to give up his dick. I won't reveal too much of the plot, but like. <laughs> It's on him to save the universe, and the only way you can do it is by basically having his penis sacrificed. Um, we, just and, all, we just all go have to die. Dude, she's like, she's like, yo, yep. she's super, super against it. And one of the doctors hands her a catalog of prosthetic dish. She's like, I just don't think we should be. Oh, wait she a second. Keeps yeah. flipping, and she's like, Oh, um, what's the difference between these two models? <laughs> and the husband's like, Wait a minute, what? Because that D twelve. <laughs> You know, it's only a matter of time, man. Yeah. It's all good. I kind of like mine. I'm attached to it. Yep. So you brought a couple things here. I did. So uh, from the podcast before, I uh, heard you like to uh, surf and uh, throw rocks in the ocean. So this one is from my uh, my backyard. So I'm trying to dig out a boulder so uh, to plant and build like a natural fence in yeah. case like to stop more cars from driving off and hitting my house. So a car hit my house. Um, it's wild, bro. Uh, on video. On video. What? I have it on video. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No way. Oh, yeah. yeah, true how story. How'd it happen? Uh, <laughs> like, what's the context behind what, this? Story? Do you want me to speculate, or do you want me to be like what I was told? I mean, because I was in the kitchen trying to do the dishes. I'll well, never what do were the you fucking, told? What was I told? That yeah. the, the brakes didn't work or that they didn't hit the brakes. And then, uh, I don't know, I just remember her falling out of the car. And then uh, what was also crazy about that is two days before that is uh, I had my last VA appointment and they told me that I lacked empathy. And I was like, all right, so I lack empathy as a human. I don't care about nobody. That's cool. Whatever. Well, uh, they uh, ended up (laughs) hitting my house on that Friday. So... uh, the women or the woman falls out. I call nine one one, and then I started like trying to give her first aid. And then, uh, you know, if I lacked empathy, I think I would have just like told them that they couldn't have parked here and went yeah. back in the fucking side. Yeah. You stand at the edge of the road until the <laughs> you need paramedics. Get here. <laughs> if you lacked empathy, you would have walked out and been like, eh, "Somebody's probably already called nine one one." Yeah, you turned that, around and walked back. Exactly. This really ain't my not problem. my problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That whole bystander thing. Yeah. Yep. But yeah, so uh, this rock is from my backyard. Uh, the wild thing is, is that if you take a look at it, uh, you know, I don't know. TSA let me fly through with it on the plane. Yeah, you oh, said that you. thing is sharp. <laughs> uh, you weren't lying. <laughs> no. Yeah, take a gander at it, bro. But you know, you got to do what you got to do. Box cutters and shit. I've never flown a plane. I never want to. Thank you. That could for sure open a box. It could. It could. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you. And then this book is uh, The Lucifer Principle. It, uh, I kind of explained a little bit about it. It's kind of like we're a super organism as human beings, and maybe we should start thinking like that. And uh, It's pretty wild. I won't give it away. I think you should read it. I think you should read it. And uh, I gave it on the behalf of, uh, I like the last studio and uh, how it had like the bookshelf and everything. And I was like, oh, this is what's up. Uh, I like the setup. And then we ruined it. Yeah, I heard. I heard y'all ruffians. Y'all were like doing WWE up in there and like <laughs> fucking shit up. So yeah, man, they didn't want us there anymore. Yeah, I heard. <laughs> That's I heard all y'all right. wild. Yeah, wild human beings. Well, thank you. And so, what I love is that you listen to our podcast because you know that we read books, and uh, and I surf and I take. I'm a trying to get in the book club. Book clubs. And- <laughs> so I actually have two new books. Uh, I'm not sure which one I'm going to read first. I'm probably going to read the Jordan Peterson one first. Uh, what is it? The 12. Uh, I got, it's actually in here. Uh, Richard Dawkins. Uh, Jordan Peterson. I mean, Jordan Peterson. And then the other Richard one. Dawkins. Hold on. Oh, well, I just got this one. I feel like there's one more book I just got. It was small. I don't remember what it was. Anyways. Is it the book that I gave you? Yes. Oh, yeah. The War on... Uh, the Hidden War? The Hidden War. Yeah. So I'm going to check that one out too. That's exactly right. Thank you. That one's cool. Yeah. I'm excited Have to read Have you ever that. heard of that book? No. So it's a book about, it's written by a, um, 
a uh, fishing game warden. And he signed up. Is that the one you were talking about with like the golden pot leaf on the leaf? Yeah, yeah. All right, yeah. So I, yeah, y'all were talking about it on the one pot like cast, and yeah, yep. that did it's wild. Intriguing. It's at my house. Yeah. So is well, it? tell the people, tell the people about it real quick. Yeah. So this guy, he signed up for uh, twelve rules for life, I believe. Yeah, twelve rules the, for life. That's it. Uh, he signed up to be a department of fishing game warden because he thought that he was going to be doing what most people think fishing game wardens do, like enforcing wildlife. Uh, mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Uh, laws and regulations. And instead, he found himself um, encountering cartel grows. These are outdoor grows, and they were, like, they are just trashing the, the environment. So, like, not only were a lot of them growing on, like, federal land, like BLM land, um, but they were using carbofuran, which is just uh, an, an incredibly toxic um, pesticide. Uh, it's it's apparently sweet or something, so bears will eat it and die. Uh, deer will eat it and die. Uh, they were diverting full streams that were endangering like oh, wow. native trout and stuff. It's insane. And and then you know like they're leaving plastic sheeting everywhere. They were leaving uh, generator fuel, so on and so forth. Um, so I was completely unaware that the cartels were growing. I mean, I figured that. I mean, honestly, I I can't say that I figured I thought that they were growing in, in the United States. I didn't think that they would be growing here. But they're literally, not only are they growing here, but they're growing on federal land. It's Which insane. I think is the craziest part. Yeah. 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 Like, and then, like, there's a lot of stories of people who own private property, like, coming to their property or finding a, you know, if you own acres and acres and acres, it's not like you're going to see every corner of your All property of every day. Yeah. And so, they'll come out, like, <laughs> why does my well water taste funny or whatever, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, but also... Like, out here in California, it's nice and dry. Like, I'm not worried about bud rot out here. Yes. Whereas back home, I got to think of a strain that uh, is going to be acceptable to, uh, like, the, 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 yeah, more moisture. So, it's, like, a little bit iffy. Um, so, yeah. I wonder yeah. if they're doing that on any other federal land in other states. I'm Hard sure. I mean, yeah. Nevada. Nevada's got a ton of BLM land. Yeah. By the way, that's not Black Lives Matter. That is the Bureau of Land Management. Those of you who didn't know that. Oh, just like BJS, which is uh, the Blow Bureau. Drop, Susie? No, oh, wait. It's the Bureau of Justice uh, Justice Statistics. We can get into that in a little bit later if you like. Or we could just talk about it right now about how, uh, like, what, one in four in uh, people in prison is a, a uh, veteran? Yeah, and what was the other one? The homeless as well, right? The homeless as well. There's a whole bunch of homeless people. So now you're talking two fours. That's one half for the people at home yeah. of veterans are either yeah you're either going to be uh homeless, homeless or, in or in jail so when you get out that's what you got to look forward to sweet future bro yeah i know right but i think that prepares us for that well so i often joked and heard it joked about that the military specifically like the army and the marine corps prepares you to be homeless <laughs> i can see it i can totally see it yeah awesome this is how you build a hooch. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so we talked about this like, okay, so like a, a week or two ago, I posted a thing and I said, uh, I think it, it was like, uh, this is mental health and this is shit or something like that. This is medicine and this is shit. And it was the woods and the other one was a pill. The pill was the shit. And I had some people, I got a little backlash. Not The majority of the people agreed. I had a few people who were like, you know, they felt some kind of way because I attacked them, defended them because they're on medication. That's not what I meant to do. But what I am aware of is this. The benefits that we get from, for example, taking a hike in the woods, not a, you know, a metaphorical hike, an actual hike out in the woods. I ain't going to take a hike. When we exercise, get some physical exertion, Things happen in our body. Chemicals are released. Good things happen. We feel better about ourselves. Uh, Our self-esteem goes up. And the mental benefits are just as good, if not better, than the physical benefits we get from this, right? So I understand that these people were upset because they wanted me to validate them taking whatever, Zoloft or whatever it is they're on, okay? But I'm aware that a lot of the people 
who are in the military who've experienced trauma and were trying to seek, you know, some sort of uh, relief from their symptoms, went to the VA, were given prescription pills and not much else, and thought that that would help them and would get rid of their symptoms. But it led a lot of them to suicide instead. Now, I'm not saying that hiking in the woods is going to be your answer. I also love surfing. I, I like golfing. I walk, so it's six and a half miles for me to go walk around. I get outside, I breathe fresh air, and I walk. It's good for me. I like hiking mountains. It doesn't have to be that, but you got to do something physical. You can't just sit at home and crochet. You can't mm-hmm. sit at home and watch Jerry Springer and just eat your pills. It doesn't work. Mm-mm. So I'm not saying that everything uh, can be fixed by a, a hike in the woods. What I am saying is when we were talking about being out in the woods, my sleep is almost never better than when I'm the sun goes down and there's no, the only ambient light or whatever is the stars. My body gets into that circadian rhythm. It knows I'm supposed to be going to bed soon. It, when the sun comes up, it knows I'm supposed to be getting up soon. That just happens. It's natural. But what we want to do is give me a quick fix, doc. And it doesn't work. I have not seen it be like, so I'm not, that doesn't mean like people who have serious mental health issues, like schizophrenia or, you know, if you've got migraines, you need to help mitigate those, something to that effect. But what I am saying is if you have trauma and you think that the pills are going to benefit you in a way that gets rid of your symptoms you're fooling yourself and a doc selling you some bullshit doesn't exist so i don't buy into that that's based on my experience and what i've seen but i don't mean to offend any well, of and, and doctors want to help too that's the thing is For like sure. a majority of doctors want to help but like if if a doctor is also not going to sit there and give you the one-on-one therapy that perhaps you could get at another specialist you yeah. know what i mean they're yeah. going to do their job so. and they don't have time for that Right. So, so I feel like a a big part of it is what you seek out too. So I, you know, I don't know. I think that a lot of, um, a lot of people that do good on things like, cause I, I've been on antidepressants before I tried them yeah. for a few months. They didn't help me. And I, I gained like 15 pounds and I was like, fuck this. Because yeah. then I'm looking in the mirror like, Oh my God, like now I'm a fat piece yeah, of you shit. You feel like, worse about yeah, yourself, yeah. not oh. better. Yeah, so I was like, fuck this, dude, and I stopped them. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Kinetic Ink Tattoo Company. If you're looking to get a tattoo or piercing in the Folsom area, you have to check out Kinetic Ink. You'll realize that this is not your ordinary shop the second you walk through the door. Kinetic Ink is built to bring together the veteran and first responder communities in a place where they can connect with one another, share their stories, and get tattooed by world-class artists. What I love most about Kinetic is that a percentage of every tattoo is donated to Warfighter Overwatch to help vets and first responders when they need it most. The sense of community and camaraderie they've built is unlike any shop I've been in. Go check them out. They're located in Folsom at 47 Atoma Street, right across the street from City Hall. Mention the Patriotic Podcast and get 15% off Kinetic Inc. merchandise. Shout out to Kinetic for sponsoring the pod. Now back to our episode. I think that a lot of people jump on pills expecting them to work without changing any other habits Mm. i can't sleep so because i'm anxious or or whatever but when when your habit is sitting there in bed for three hours like doom scrolling fucking twitter or whatever it is you're doing like you need to be willing to change other habits too and the ones that i've chosen to change are are, like you said going outside like when i when i came off of those (laughs) I started fishing like twice a week, golfing twice a week, getting outside um, and, and, you know, fell in love with those things all over again. I've always loved them both, but um, now those are my new habits, you know, like now when, now when I'm stressed out or whatever, I need to blow off stream uh, steam. I, I hike up a couple of miles away to Folsom Lake and, and go fishing all day and like hiking that physical exertion too. Like it, it, Let's keep, let's you kind of exercise those demons. I don't know. Yeah. There's just something about it. And like, I don't, maybe, maybe people don't trust it because there's not science to back it. You know, like there's not tangible <laughs> proof that getting outside, maybe there is tangible proof that getting outside improves. Yeah. But so, like, it's, it's just so <coughs> subjective. But I also think it, then it goes with the mindset too, is that like you have a, you're on a mission. Your mission is to go fishing for the day. Mm-hmm. The mission is therefore to have fun, catch fish, and then, 
at the end of the day is to return home safely. So you are on a mission, a task, a purpose. This is what we have chosen to do for today. And that's all what Iraq was. What's the next mission? What's yeah. the next mission? What's this? So, and I think that's what life is all about too, is this, what's the next mission? It's going to go up. It's going to go down. We're going to have well, and hard I think, times, bad times, but. I think you know, when we have that mentality too, because I very much have that mentality, but I think that that can get you in trouble with people that don't understand. They might say that you lack empathy. Perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? So like a lot of people don't really understand that. And I think that kind of goes, I I think that plays into why veterans do have a hard time getting jobs and stuff like that, because people don't, people don't get it. We don't just work for a check. Right. And I, and that's where I, again, I don't understand. I, I fought for what I thought American values were. And why is it that in Washington, DC children can go hungry on Friday at lunch and not have another meal until Monday morning? Like that's the nation's capital. Why, why is that happening? Like, how can we, why, how do we fix that? Or why are we not fixing it? And, um, Fram, shout out to Beverly Weaver. Um, she says it's all about political wellness. It's just that we, we don't want to do it. Yeah. It's we, like, we'll do we assume they're doing the right thing with our money. Well, the government, and since we've all worked for the federal government, I think it's fair to say this. What I learned, one of the things that I learned was, you use whatever money they've given you, whatever budget you have, spend it all because they will not give you the same amount next time. But if you do, then you can ask for more. Guess what they're continuing to do? I, I joined the army 20 years ago, 21 years. So we're talking about this has been going on for generations at this point. They all say we need a little bit more. We need a little bit more. We're going to spend a little bit more on this, a little bit more on that. And I don't mean they should be getting by with the bare minimum, but we shouldn't be wasting taxpayers' dollars. And there's been no oversight, no accountability. Isn't it, isn't it crazy that John Stewart is the loudest voice? He's that so is, much louder than every single one of our every single one of our congressmen. And trips me out. It's wild. How many times has that guy been down at the Capitol, like almost in tears for the firefighters, bro? On yeah. 11 for the like you name it. He's down for there. the he's burn like, pits. Yeah, he's like, like, what the fuck are we doing? Yeah. So. That reminds me. Just about, sign off with "Do your job." Yeah, it's like fuck. Gives you goosebumps, dude. That's what you want to see from, you know, patriots from other people, you know, in our country or leaders. Yeah, leadership. Well, yeah. I was gonna say when you talked about, <coughs> I apologize for the coughing. Got some sort of. You've been choked coughing. up all day. I know, but I wanted to say. So recently, I got hooked up with this organization called One More Mission, OneMoreMission dot com, and. Essentially, what they want is people who are veterans or whatever to uh, serve serve their country and their community. No, I'm good. I'll take water. I got water. Yeah, I'm good. Uh, one one more mission wants guys to veterans to go down and be poll watchers, not like the year analysis, but go down and just make sure that things are done right. And you know, it's not about political affiliation or anything like that it's about serving your community serving your country and making sure that uh one of the most valuable things that we have here is our vote and there has been so much division between you know republicans and democrats veterans just want people first off we like make a fair fight if it's gonna you know if you're politicians give us your spiel and let the people decide well if you're taking those uh you know, that away from them or, or making it, uh, the process muddied or, or make us question whether or not it's working properly, then the best thing to do is to go down there and get involved. And I think, uh, I'm glad that I'm gonna, I'm gonna go be a poll watcher and it's not a year analysis this time, you know? So, yeah. uh, yeah. They're all gone. Yeah. So anyways, I encourage the folks at home, if you're a veteran, your first responder or something, you got some time, uh, make it a priority. Go down there and sign up. One more mission. Sign up to be a poll watcher and get involved in your community. I would also encourage uh, to get involved with the VFW. I am not a member yet, but I think it's going to be beneficial to mm -hmm. uh, just, you know, helping out, doing whatever, because then it puts that one more level connection or that one more yeah. uh, dot of connectivity that, hey, you and I have something in common. Uh, <laughs> what's up, bro? You know what I mean? You guys both attended the 
Warfighter Overwatch, uh, well, we helped put on the Ramsey, remember Ramsey Cornhole, uh, inaugural Cornhole tournament yesterday. What, what did you guys think? What did you think? Uh, it was very nice. It was um, very, very nice. Uh, and then I think I had alleviated to you in the car that it, it was, it's odd though, man, because in order to see all that love from people, someone has to pass away. And it's know. like, that's, it's weird. It's weird. We gotta have, we gotta have that happen before. Right? Yeah, yeah. I feel that way. Why can't all this happen before? Like, yeah. why, why can't all of that, like, love be shared? Like, hey, we're all cool people. We all got TBI. We're all totally badass individuals. Yeah. Like, you know, <laughs> why can't we, why can't we? Yeah. But, uh, I don't, I, I yeah, I, I had no words for Mrs. Ramsey. I just could offer her a hug. And I think mm-hmm. that's, I don't know. I'm sure she appreciated that. Yeah. 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 Got two of them. So, yeah. Most of them. Yeah. Uh, I can always expect um, a fantastic event out of Warfighter. But um, what I was, I really was blown away by the turnout. Yeah. And um, not to say that, we just didn't have a lot of time to plan it. I mean, like it, it really came together in the last month or so. Yeah. Right. Yeah. If that, and the sheriff and the, uh, district attorney were there too. Yeah. I mean like yeah. they, the, so, and I don't think you get this everywhere and that's really unfortunate, which is why I think it's important to keep spreading what we do. But, um, the community really cares and they, that's they turned right. out Yeah, and, um, and that was really cool to see. And, and, like you were saying, man, it, it does suck that it takes something like that to to bring everybody together, man. Like, I, it was a fun time. Like, it was a, we had a really fun time. I mean, we were playing cornhole. We had yep. drinks. The The property was outrageous. Yep. Amazing. Like, Beautiful. Outrageous. Yeah. So Beautiful. Major shout out to him for, and for, you know, letting us use the space. Um, but despite all the fun we had and what a beautiful day it was, like, it's still, you're kind of there with a the heavy heart, you know, because you know, ultimately why you're all there but again the connection point of how uh i have like i was looking at a picture of it and i'm sorry uh um i'm sorry austin but uh i have that goofy picture of myself in the beret with no flash from straight out of basic Basically, training yeah. so you know like it's like that's that's a connection <laughs> point i have that related and then another connection point is i have a picture of myself in body armor next to pot plants but you know it is what it is <laughs> Which was super funny because it is super funny. O'Connor's in that picture, it is, right? Is. And it's one of our iconic. It's just not something that we saw a lot. It's not like Afghanistan where they have fields of weed. So in Iraq, it was a little. It was it was random. It was different. And I will tell you, once we saw that one plant, the whole operation security went to total shit. And we were like, "Oh, dip, there's a pot plant in <laughs> Iraq." <laughs> there was a gas station in Iraq too. I think it's time. Is it time for the gas station? And how I became the prince of Baghdad. We were uh, <laughs> we were at Fab Rustamaya, and across the street was a, a gas station. And that gas station had had issues, many issues. Number one, there's there'd be lines as long as the day, uh, people just trying to get some fuel, and the prices had gone up or all that stuff. But we weren't really sure what was going on, and we were pretty sure the Mahdi militia had something to do with it. They were saying that it was the Mahdi militia, and that there was a. Uh like just fraudulent stuff that I guess they had laws in Iraq at the time where uh, you couldn't uh, like modify your gas tank and operate your vehicle with more gas in the vehicle. So uh, that was against the law. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So uh, the sir, which was, uh, he's just the sir. He came in and gave us the mission brief that, Hey, we're going to the gas station because these people might be shady. So, uh, we roll up in the gas station and, you know, zip cuff everybody to the, the standard SOPs. And well, come to find out that like they had a rack load of money, like just a whole bunch of dinar and they were operating under some shady, shady stuff. <laughs> and we took them back as detainees. I remember uh, Money Mo. He's my Money Mo. Mm-hmm. Money Mo is my man. Uh, and Prison, he's my man too. Yeah. But uh, yeah, Money Mo got some pistols. That was shit was sweet. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> anywho, um, we get them back to the fob. 
And that's where I quickly learned that detainees suck because you have to now provide security for the said detainee. Mm-hmm. You have to feed said feed detainee. Them, all that. Yeah. And it's like, man, like, I don't like prisoners. And then you return them over to uh, the Iraqi judicial system and they would just let them go. Yeah. So it's like, why? Why even bring them back to the fob and feed them? Like, that's what just happened to them. They're, we're bringing them back to the fob to feed them. Yep. And, no, I'm done with that. But, uh, anyways, I had a, <laughs> somehow, in the absence of orders, I was left holding a bag of uh, Iraqi dinar. It was a pillowcase. <laughs> it was a shitload of fucking Iraqi dinar. <laughs> and the lonely specialist, I just kept on minding my business. Like, well, they can trust me with this bag. I'm going to hold on to it. <laughs> It's secure. <laughs> yeah, it's secure. <laughs> and I'm going to make sure it stays secure. Yeah, I mean, why not? Well, you know, I feel I worked hard in Iraq. So, you know, I, I bought a lot of stuff with that Iraq you done not Um, I spent it on the economy very well. Like, <laughs> you could buy bags, like trash bag full of bread for $5. And it's like, dude, this is what's up. So I would just buy it and give it away. So I was like, all right, well, I'm doing, I'm doing nice things. You are. And, you know, and I have no idea how much this money is to their economy, but, you know, a wad of cash for a whole bag is fucking sufficient, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Here, here's a wad. Here's a wad. Um, it was nice. But then... Um, dun, dun, dun. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. <laughs> but then somebody came through the barracks or whatever the building we were staying in and was like, hey, if uh, uh, the... Cunt News Network and OPEC have got involved and found out that the Americans have stolen money from them and they're pissed. And I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, you get caught with that. Um, they're like, if anybody has uh, Iraqi dinar, they need to get rid of it now. And so I was like, well, fuck, this is a lot of money. So the one thing I could only do was, uh, hey, Danny. Can you hold this bag and this fucking magazine for me, please? Magazine, not like <laughs> like for for bullets. Nah, man, it's Playboy. <laughs> yeah, I could do that. <laughs> All right, cool. I'll be back for the bag later. And that's how that conversation went. And Mister Owen, uh, Mister Danny, uh, held the bag for me. I did hold the bag. I kept the magazine. <laughs> it had Vita Guerra on the cover. Vita Guerrera, Guerrera's ass really did take it to her top. Like that's all she's known for. What else is she known for? When I got home from Iraq, Vita Guerrera was at the PX one day, and there was a line. And one of my soldiers who had been blown up, Bubba, thank you, Bubba, he was with me, and he had one. Of, I forgot what they're called, but it's like this cage that goes around. It's named for a doctor who made it. It's like this halo, this like cage that goes around his leg to hold it all together, or whatever. Some guy came up and said, hey, did that happen in, you know, at war in Iraq or whatever? And he's like, yes, sir. He said, y'all come up front. So we skipped this hour-long line or whatever it was going to be, go straight to the front. She takes some pictures with us. I ask her, she's doing a movie signing for like, I don't know, it's National Lampoon, some National Lampoon movie. That's not what I want her to sign for me. <laughs> I got this magazine I'd like you to sign for me, Miss Vita. And she had the biggest shit-eating grin. I was like, do I ask for her number right now? Hey, uh, so I'm going to be at this club later. Anyhow, you could sign the... I was going to the centerfold, the picture that I liked the best. The reason it's the centerfold. I, I was stopped and said, uh-uh, she can sign the cover. Don't open that. Because the whole battalion's DNA was on that. So good order and discipline can't be opening this up on the PX at the, you know, on base, whatever, man. So uh, I didn't get the middle sign, but I did get the front cover signed, and then my ex wife took care of all that. But I got to tell you, that was always a funny story to me just because it don't ask to tell was my policy on most shit. Um, but what, what ended up being like super jacked up then is like, I get the bag back from you and I have to burn it in a field. Like my, my leadership obviously knew that, uh, I had a bag of cash cause we're <laughs> yeah. burning it in the field. <laughs> <laughs> that, but 
Dude, the, the army's weird, man. Like, I, I love everybody I served with. Like, it's the brotherhood. It's awesome. Um, It's just... Well, what did you think? Because not everyone always got along. What did you think about Pridgen hitting Eichner? With the car. Oh. um, It was coming to it. <laughs> it was. It, it was building up. It was building up. You know? We're much like a family and brothers that fight and argue. We get into altercations, and then you get over it. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes you still don't like the person, but you work together still. But you got to think also, too, is like uh, you're taking everybody from America and putting them in one collective, and they have to work together for a common goal. <laughs> and then, like, we have to bond. We have to gel. And then that's what I would like your perspective on. How did the officers bond and gel? And, like, how did you, you build camaraderie on – that level or did you or did you um i don't know i can only really speak from experience at my unit that i went to in the california guard and um i don't want to like shit talk them but like when i came in our command was really good when i got out it like it wasn't so good yeah um i feel like that's normal regular army guard doesn't really matter yeah and um at least in, in my experience and like even, even at training, like at Bullock and whatnot, like our basic officer leadership course, um, it seemed to me like a lot of people are vying for a limited number of positions. So there's not as much camaraderie because there's, it's, it's more competitive, I think. Hmm. Um, that a lot of sense. the places I went were super clicky. Like if you weren't on staff, you weren't shit. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like it's, it's competitive. Um, I would liken it much more to a corporation. Yeah. Right. Um, that said, like I, one of the comments that I always got was that I was spending way too much like fraternization with, with the enlisted. So like everybody always told me I was a fucking specialist at heart. And like, I, I agree, <laughs> honestly, like if I could do it all over again, I'd definitely enlist hmm. like a hundred percent. I would. Cause like the, the planning and strategic part of it is all cool, but like when you think that you really nailed something, like whether it's even if it's just a fucking training mission or live fire exercise or something, yeah, you're like, this plan is gonna kick ass, but yeah. you don't even really get to execute it. You know what I mean? Like you want to be out there doing all the fun shit. Yeah, like that's what we train on because like if you're the last man standing, you have to be able to know the job of your your lowest Joe, right? Right. And that's when I had the most fun was doing that shit. The, these guys did a fucking mission with SEAL Team 3 and got an award. For, like, this was Chris Kyle and those guys. We didn't know who the fuck they were. You know, we knew they were the SEALs, but that yeah. was it. And a bunch of those guys got a fucking award. I don't know if you did, but a bunch of them got an award. Well, half the platoon went to, uh, I'll just say, the task force over there in yeah. the green zone. Yep. And uh, Adams and all those guys went over yeah, there. Yeah, they went over there and did that. That's cool. So, uh, fucking Gatorade had a protein shake before Gatorade had a fucking protein shake that they sold to uh, the civilians. And that shit rocked, dude. That was the best. I love going over there to get it. Yeah. Well, to see everybody else. But <laughs> the main mission was to get the protein. <laughs> so we had some guys down in the with the ODA, um, the Operational Detachment Alpha. So one of the Green Beret units, um, SF units down in the green zone. And we sent a bunch of guys down there. So we had two crews, two Bradley crews. I got a I got a video I'll show you. Maybe you can add some of it in here. Yeah. Uh they wanted to know what the Bradleys could do. So they brought in a bunch of cars. They're in a compound in the green zone. No one's allowed in there. When we go visit, they let like two people in. That's it. No one goes in, right? They started crushing these cars like fucking what, what's the monster truck show? Yeah, like yeah. Monster Jam. Yeah. What a Bradley in the green zone in the little compound there at one point one of the bradleys gets stuck a little bit so they but he crushed cars oh, like a row of cars i'll show you also I'll, I'll give you the video it is it is fantastic one of the guys Mesa, was one of our fisters who was down there um and he he passed away after we got back but like they they filmed this so the guys are like holy shit so they back up their little uh four wheelers and shit and they're like all right i see these things are for real what they what they well, I'll tell you what they discovered was that if you drive fast enough, I think it was anything over 15 miles an hour and hit one of those like Jersey barriers, the concrete divide, it would turn to dust. Damn. 
turn that shit to powder. How heavy are those? A Bradley. Uh, oh, Bradley's thirty two thousand pounds, but the those Jersey barriers I think were like three thousand pounds or something, Damn. or two thousand pounds. Depends on how long it was, I guess. But they would hit them, and there's just like a couple pieces of rebar in there. They would hit them, and it would just go boof, disintegrate. I was like, how the f- like how fast are you going? He's like, oh, I don't remember. But after that, we were just doing as long as you're doing like twenty, we're good. <laughs> I think if you're over 15, you're square, you're all right. But you just hit them hard. I'm like, holy fuck. Yeah. I but, do know that a Bradley will flatten a car like a yeah. pancake. Yeah. It was when they showed, so they showed this video from Ukraine where they like ran over, and I think it might have been a civilian's car, and it looked like they did it on purpose. <laughs> now, we didn't have that, but we did, well, I say we, one of our companies in a Bradley did run over a civilian's car and the civilian did die. He was alive for a little bit and his car was pancaked. He was crushed down inside of it. And they, one guy held his hand for a while. So I'm yeah, back. I got that picture. Do you Yeah. send that to me? I got to find it. Yeah. I was, I was gonna say I had it for a while. But I, I don't know where it is. I haven't seen it in years. Uh, so that guy was like, you know, that's a wild picture too. He, Cause it's like the perfect angle. It's like, and at, he should have stopped, right? We having a convoy and people over there. They knew by then they knew. I knew they knew they had to know. You don't drive Anywhere near our vehicles. We'll shoot your ass. Like, I'm not just going to, like, okay, they fucking we, ran you over as an accident. I'll shoot you. But we rode around with signs on the back of our vehicles that said, stay, stay back. Stay back. Yeah. And then we had we will shoot orange cones. Or it was. We had orange cones. We had that. I had to drive around with that uh reflective, like, fucking bar yeah, yeah. with that white. uh It was a, a, a white uh, traffic fucking yeah. barrier thing. Yep. That was just for civilian use. That was all it was. It was not for the fucking... Dude, I don't know, man. My buddy that went to Afghanistan said, I was curious if you guys experienced this in Iraq, <laughs> but he said that they would, like when people would get close, that he would point rifles at them and people wouldn't really do anything. But then if you pointed a, a pistol at them, they would like flip out and turn around and drive away. So, yes, the uh, the pistol was more um, more psychological to them because it presented them to are, they were used to them being executed that way. Like that's uh, how Saddam took power. He executed it, and that's how he rose up. Like that's how he shit. I thought so, like uh, maybe it's because they're normalized to rifles. Because don't a lot of dudes carry around rifles? AKs. Well, yeah, AKs. Every shit. family yeah. has an AK. Yeah. Well, I never thought of that Saddam. Yeah. Perspective. That's and you know, there's not very many pistols that we. I never really came into contact with very much pistols. No. And then like almost everything was rifle AKs mostly. Yeah. And then. Uh, the pistols were small. If you did find them, they're like the little twenty twos or like a seventeen, yeah. something like that yeah. nature. That like Russian, a like little Takarov or whatever. But it's no, called. like little little uh, a lot of Russian shit. Like yeah. yeah, but like a little like fucking um, oh, almost like the Derringer. Or yeah, a little like Derringer a <laughs> flips out of a belt buckle. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and a hundred percent why I believe the uh, French fries didn't want us to, to invade Iraq it was because they. Like sold into their economy because when yeah. we were over there, it was all what was it, Galwall cigarettes? Yeah, yeah, Galwall cigarettes. They spoke, well, they didn't speak French, but they dressed like French, French people. Oh, yeah, 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 that's all right. I do remember too that you could get uh, you could trade chocolate for volume, that was a thing. <laughs> you could get volume for chocolate, you get a lot of stuff like two favorite there. things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I remember. One night we were on uh, we we're on patrol, so we had a lot of crazy shit happen. I feel like like a lot of crazy shit happened. Man. One night, uh, so we were out there. I know Wiggins and I talked about this like not that long ago, but uh, so we were in the two Bradleys on our way out that night. Uh, when we first started our patrol, we leave the fob, we turn uh, from Brewers down to uh. No, from Pluto to Brewers, and we're going down to over by 564. Uh, and when we're driving down there, they, like, as soon as we left the fob, they had said, like, a couple guys were out there and looked like they were trying to lay wire or something. So the guys took off. They couldn't find them. We go out there, and we ended up setting up on the overpasses. And I'm like, you know, it's going to be nighttime. There's not going to be anybody out. So... I think there's no way they're going to come back because they were nearly caught last time. No. Either they didn't pay attention or whatever, but we're sitting up on top of the overpass and I'm right where the off ramp is and they're just over in the middle a little bit and we're scanning, you know, both sides going around and 
sure as shit, these guys come out and they're carrying, each one is carrying an EFP. They each have one. They're going to come out and hook it up to the fucking wire that they laid earlier. So they're coming out of the Mahalas and going all the way to the road right there. And I thought, you got to be fucking kidding me. So the lieutenant is calling the battalion and he's trying to talk to them and tell them what's going on. And I start talking on the company net to Sergeant King and Wiggins over there. And we ended up killing those two guys who were coming out there. What happened was, I don't know if you remember, but our, our XO got promoted to Lieutenant Colonel. Hadley became the XO and we got another S3. And I don't remember that guy's name now, but he came from, I think he came from Taji. And so he didn't know what the fuck we were doing. He's like, you guys don't have positive identification. I'm like, uh, the dudes outside after curfew, they're carrying boxes and they were laying wire. What else do I need to know? I've been here long enough. I promise I know what they're doing. Well, 98% of the time they were laying EF fucking P's or yeah. IEDs. Yeah. What else are you doing at that time? Well, he's on the farm. He don't fucking know. So we smoke these. So we start shooting at them and they're far, they're pretty far away. They're like fucking six, 700 meters away. And I never understood that either. Why did you have to call back to get judgment from somebody or somebody to go, oh, it's okay to do your thing? We didn't. The sir thought he needed to. And we said, not nah, rules of engagement say we can go ahead and engage these guys. So we did. And we smoked them. But shoot this guy with a 762. By the way, it's like when you're a kid and you like cross streams, that's your new best friend when you're peeing. All right, same thing except 240. So we're shooting. Z pattern. These guys take off running, cut across this guy, and he drops sack of potatoes. Jumps up like the Holy Spirit jumped right in his butthole, and this dude took off running. And I'm going, I know I just shot this motherfucker, so back at it. Start shooting again. He makes the corner. I'm mad. I am hot. We called Charlie. Charlie Company had some uh, Humvees. They were on patrol. Asked them to come down in the hall. It's much easier for them than us to go out there. Yeah, with the Bradleys. They're on the, hey, we'll be over there in 10 minutes or whatever, five minutes. Like, when all this shit's happening pretty, you know, fluidly. Boom! One of them goes off. They could hear it on the farm. We're like, I don't know, two miles away. And they're like, what was that? On the radio, the XO's still over there. He's listening to our situation. Oh, that was one of those EFPs that didn't have positive identification on. So if you could just go ahead and send that nine line of EOD that I sent up already, that'd be swell. Yeah. You fucking asshole. So yeah, you're going to get me killed out here trying to tell me I can't do some shit. I don't know what I'm doing. Doesn't matter. Charlie came around inside. They cut, there was a vehicle that was over there. Filmmaker, bomb maker, two dickheads who were planning it. Uh, first time an EFP emplacement team was caught. Well, two of them were killed. And the other guy, he died around the corner. He fucking bled out around the corner. That made me feel a little better. And they had a funeral for him and shit. Uh, we got a coin for that from Colonel Vale or whatever his name was from 101st. Nice. So we were attached to the 506 guys, uh, the band of brother folks. So uh, we thought that was pretty cool, but no one really gave a fuck like that that happened. What I thought was funny was this was like towards the end of our, this is like September, October. It was like now, right? Mm. So we're leaving in November. We're out of here. And... We get first cab is going to come replace us. They got a tank comes out there with us one night. And we're like, hey, listen, man, we're going to be out here all night. So just make sure you guys are scanning this sector from over here to over here. And then we'll every once in a while, we'll go patrol around. We'll drive around, move around, see, you know, try to find anything, blah, blah, blah. I tried to talk to him on the radio like once and I didn't get an answer. So I started looking at their vehicle. I point my fucking sight down at them. My cannon technically is facing them, but it's so I can look. Yeah, you, your finger's not on the trigger. No. You're good. So I go down, I'm looking, and they're not scanning. They're this not moving. Safety. That's yeah. it. Is, did you see that <laughs> patch in there? Oh, no. It was in the in the box. Oh, really? That same one. Yeah. That's hilarious. So I noticed that they're not scanning anymore, and I'm now I'm starting to like get a little worried and I keep trying to reach them, and I see two guys coming up to their vehicle, and I'm like, They've been watching you, and they know you're not scanning. They know you're all asleep. You oh, fucks. so so two local nationals were approaching the vehicle, and their turd hasn't moved in how long? I didn't know how long at that point. Oh, they shit. were definitely military age males approaching their victor, and I was like, uh, "You're about to fucking die." <laughs> so, and you've only been here for a week. Someone's got to tell your mom that you fucker. Finally, I get them, and they're like, "Oh, I don't know what was going on with our comms." Well, you're when you're asleep, you can't hear it yeah. usually. So, or turn it up. I don't know what to tell you, but you guys are about to die. And they were like, all right. They started scanning those dudes. Two guys took off running. Like, you have no idea. Like, 
you're going to be in a world of hurt for the next year. If you're going to come out here on patrol like that, you're not going to last. And you never knew what the day was going to bring. So, you know, you didn't know whether or not you were going (laughs) to catch it outside the wire by driving around. Yeah, 107, come through your fucking door or room. Yeah, that's all we did was just drive around the Mahalas. And uh, then, yeah, once we got back on the FOB, you were going to catch a rocket. You were going to catch a mortar. Yeah. But I don't know. I made it now. Yeah, back home, baby. Yeah, back home. Which now leads me to this then is like, what again, what's going on back here at home? It's a mess, man. It is a mess. <laughs> Dude, I love it out here in California, but y'all, I don't, I don't like seeing six dollars and sixty nine cents a gallon That's for absurd. gas. I told you what. What is every California that you talk to here? What's what are we always talking about? Uh, uh, leaving or yeah, uh, our escape take plan, bro? This back over. It's hard. It's hard because when you see so many patriots who love this country and love this state, you know, I was born and raised here, like. You want to keep fighting for it. You want it to be, you know, reach the potential that it has. We're supposed to be the fifth largest economy, whatever, the sixth largest economy in the fucking world. And mm-hmm. My gas is this. My roads are shit. My, you know, all these things. You need a nap to avoid the piles of shit and needles in San Francisco. It used to be one of my favorite cities to go to when I was a kid. I don't even, I don't even take my kids there anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And, like, I would love to go see San Francisco, but... I don't want to be stepping over shit or hopping over shit or making it be yeah. like parkour. Like I don't want that. Yeah. And not not to say that that's a knock on homeless or uh Well that's Nancy Pelosi's Ill. district. Yeah, how absurd. Makes is that? fucking sense. Well then how is she making money if ain't nobody in her district working, bro? Well, she's getting rich how? because she makes really smart buys right before they vote on certain stocks and companies. I'm not really sure how that works out. What was that? Hold on. What was that thing? Something tracker. Uh, unusual whales. So check this out. That's how you track what they buy. And then yeah, buy, buy heard, in I kind. Un- unusual whales posted uh, yesterday Uh-oh. that the United States has bought 10,000 doses of an anti radi like a blood medicine for anti-radiation. I can see it. That's that's because they know we're about to go to nuclear war. That's a little ominous to me. Eh, I don't believe it. You don't think so? No, not at all. What do you think's gonna happen? What do you mean? What do I think's gonna happen? What do you think? What do you think's gonna happen in Russia? What do you think's gonna happen with us in China? What do you think? Mm, what, do you, what do you think Biden's gonna get us into? I would think that China might uh, go after Taiwan and just to bring it back into the fold, like uh, Russia is trying to do with Ukraine. But, uh, and Biden said that we would protect them with boots on the ground. Do you believe that? Where? If China attacks Taiwan. Possibly. And if not, if not, then uh, we have no global position anymore. Like our treaties are then therefore done. Because, because we're then, not protecting our allies. Yeah, we would not be protecting our allies at that point. You have to admit, that's... if Because <coughs> then... like, uh, Listen, for, I want to write me, Zelensky off on my taxes. Oh, okay. Go I mean, it. we've given them billions of dollars. Well, weapons. I did post the meme where, like, uh, he was, like, dancing like a stripper. Yeah. And uh, old Biden was just throwing the ones. Yeah, and I feel that's how it is because. Uh, I got two words for you, bud. <laughs> what's that? What's that? What's, what's your two words? I'm made in America. Oh, you're made in America? Which is two I words? was literally just going to say that. I was like, how about that, dude? How do you fuck that up? Like, come on, man. You're making he, it too easy now. Like that, that shit. He, what like, do you mean now? He followed the Secret Service agent who said, "Right here, Mr. President." It's not like he didn't, you know, frequent the place when he was Vice President. He follows the Secret Service into the around the bushes, and he's like, "No, no, come back over here, Grandpa." Like, fuck, bro. I just don't like. Do they not? Do do his like hardcore supporters don't? Do they not understand <laughs> that that is also divisive? Is also divisive to have. Somebody like that. Like, there's a lot of people that fucking care about this country. Yeah. Like, it, it doesn't only go one way, dude. Like, that's not leadership, It's bro. not. It's not only the right that's fucking divisive. Sorry. Nobody believes that that guy's in charge. And that no. is the, that for me, that's the part that's dangerous. When you're saying that this guy's a puppet or that he's like some sort of, it's all a facade, that it's all um, bullshit. He's not actually in charge. That takes away from what the president 
fuck the presidency is and who the president is. Like, if we're supposed to believe that this person can unite both sides of the aisle and all the be bipartisan and all this shit for the good of the American people. See, I don't believe that we we have bipartisan people at all. I think that they're completely divisive and they're going to. He said that half the people who voted, you know, or however many people voted for fucking Trump are extremists. I now see where does that, how does that trickle down? Well, now I see in my local campaign here, Ken Cooley calling Josh Hoover an extremist for hang, you know, for believing in some Trump issues and siding with Trump on something. Not that he believes in everything that Trump has done or whatever and said, but it's okay to have some fucking nuance. Well, holy shit. A little bit yeah. is okay. It's yeah. not going to kill you, dude. No. You can, you can. They certainly act like it, though. The, the tribalism is just like, it seems so, it seems so backwards compared to like all the other shit we're trying to do. Like, like, and, and this is a whole different issue in and of itself, but like the, the whole, uh, you know, Green New Deal thing, like, not, like banning internal combustion engines and whatnot. Like we're trying to on one side of the spectrum, progress far beyond our means. Yeah. We don't have the infrastructure or the even ability to to do any of the shit that we're going to mandate is done in about eight years. And then on the flip side, our, <coughs> on the other side of the social spectrum, we're just like fucking devolving, dude. I don't, I don't understand. To so this like tribalism, it's no longer about your constituents. Mm-hmm. Now it's about like it's it's just political football that's all it is they they literally and people get they become fans oh, yeah. just like they do for the football teams and shit they have their favorite sports teams mm-hmm. i mm-hmm. believe that working with the someone from the opposite party has um is now akin to the floor is lava i cannot touch this we'll die dude do you think we could sell democrat and republican sports jerseys Probably yes. Yes, I bet you people would buy that. Definitely, like customize your number, customize mm-hmm. your last name, mm-hmm. and it, there's like an elephant on the front, a donkey. On the front. Well, basically, we are at a point where we're red versus blue. Yeah, that's what it is. We boil it down to color now. I think, red and I think that's blue. really sad because, like, I, and it is. I I have, oh man, I, you know, I want to continue fighting for my country and fighting my for my, my community, advocating for the people who need it, and. It just makes me feel like we're not going to get anywhere because the people who are supposed to be leaders are doing anything but leading. But there's just things I don't understand is like, why did inflation have to go up for certain things? Why is Putin. gas going up? Uh, well, p- uh, gas is going down now. Biden, it's a, Biden did it. Okay. Yeah, well, he, saved, he saved us. He saved us? Don't you feel saved? No. No, because we're talking about fucking... Uh, I don't feel safe either. Nuclear apocalypse. I'm, That's right. Yeah. yeah. Scary times. Well, listen, man, I want to thank you for coming out here and spending time with us and uh, just coming and hanging out, man. Happy birthday. I appreciate it. It Happy is my birthday. birthday. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I love California. Um, I love coming out to California. Oh, yeah. I told um, you, man, you can't tell people about the part I showed you that. That's ours. It's a secret. I know. I know. That's uh, going in the vault. All right. Cool. I think you just told the people we're fucked. No, what do you mean? I know. Hey, what was up with that fucking uh, airplane flying around last night? That was the um, sheriff. They knew we were out there, and they came and did a little flyby. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah, awesome. I thought so. Yeah, the downside to California is our, you know, Active serial killers and oh stop! I did hear about that. (laughs) Well, high gas, active serial killers. um, On our next episode, right there. (laughs) On our (laughs) next episode, uh, we will discuss Halloween serial killers, and what was it? And we will solve this case. Boom! Dun dun dun! Thanks, brother. Hey, I appreciate it, man. Likewise. Thank you. Good times. As always, Ryan. Appreciate you, brother. Yeah, till next time, buddy. Yeah, man.